to the fifth and final episode of series two of The Expert View. Uh, we've had some great episodes to date and some great engagement from you, our clients and uh, partners. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you so much for that. So first up, we have a recap of Brexit, the tail end of the storm, which uh, Lisa Downing and uh, Joe Healy covered. But we, we'd like to just kind of do a recap for everybody just to talk about what has happened in the last 12 months or so since the transition period ended and um, just to talk about what our clients are still struggling with and then just go on from that and just see you know what's coming down the line in relation to Brexit yeah. you know, what's left for us to, to talk about. Absolutely I always equate it to the five stages of grief you know we start off with denial anger um, but I think we're getting closer to acceptance now right yeah <laughs> so we have some kind of an idea as to what kind of cards have been dealt and what kind of challenges that we have to face. Um, of course, there are still inconsistencies and a few, you know, not as many unknowns, mm -hmm. but a few unknowns left to be uh, tackled. But for the most part, uh, we know that, yes, the challenges that we predicted have come to pass. There yeah. are barriers to doing business in the with the EU now, if you're a British uh, company and vice versa. Um, and anybody who, uh, you know, said there wouldn't be barriers to uh, business or for businesses was talking bunkum. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not for us to worry about. We can just get down to the practicalities. So I know that, you know, the last 24 months, we've had a lot of panicked conversations of customers ringing us, looking for advice and advisory support. Lisa, we still, uh, you know, we know a lot uh, of the unknowns have been resolved, mm -hmm. uh, but there are still known unknowns <laughs> yeah. that we have to um, encounter on a daily basis. But for you, those inconsistencies um, and we'll say gray areas, what has been the biggest challenge uh, post the transition period for our, for our clients? So next up, we had Lisa Dowling and Barbara Bacic discussing SAFTI. Yeah, so I think it, it really is down to the terminology and what does SAFTI mean to different countries? And this is where the confusion lies. So maybe we just bring it back to the beginning and talk about the origin or the concept, the original concept of SAFTI and how that's evolving in the different countries. So SAFTI is an abbreviation and stands for the Standard Audit File for Tax. It was developed by the OACD and the aim was to produce the standardized format for electronic exchange of accounting data from organizations to tax authorities and external auditors. There were two main aims and two main key, key principles behind the SAFTI. The first one that the organization should be able to export information contents related to information, so invoices, ledgers, master files to tax authorities and to external auditors. And the other was just to support the tax audit procedure uh, carried out by the tax authorities and also by the external audit organizations. Sounds like a very practical and straightforward kind of concept, the original SAFTI concept. So why has it become very complicated? Because what emerged from this original concept was actually three broader areas. Uh, you can it could be divided. The first one is when based on the tax authority request, you are sending a and you may recall for our third episode we covered outsourcing and onboarding with Owen Dumphy and Lisa Dowling. And the last time when we spoke about outsourcing, we spoke about you know the consideration of your own resources, mm -hmm. what resources you are going to be able to give to this outsourcing project for VAT compliance, and what benefit is it going to bring to the business. And so you need to kind of make that assessment and then develop your plan around that based on what you can dedicate from your own resource level and also what your outsourcing provider can bring to the table too. A hundred percent. And resourcing is a key aspect as you mentioned there so from a resourcing perspective as we know compliance doesn't always cover one jurisdiction or one country it's cross country cross juris jurisdiction and um, which means you're very rarely going to have one resource or one mm -hmm. person that knows everything across across each of those countries that are involved in the imp implementation mm -hmm. so it's really about engaging with those people that that you're going to need um, on this journey in, in terms of imp implementing the software within the organization engaging with those people, getting them involved and bringing them up to speed on, 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 on where that, that journey is going to take them and at what time they're going to be needed within that implementation plan. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of it, that's a, a very brief summary of the, the project management aspect. But as I said, it's, 
whether it's big or small, you need you need a project plan yeah. and you need to be looking at your governance model and you need to be looking at your, your, your resourcing plan. And you need to understand, I suppose, the time that's needed to be dedicated to such a project because there is a myth that outsourcing uh, it, it can be quick and easy, but really it needs time investment for you to, you know, you get out what you put in, I suppose, is the, is the point there, you know, and your project plan needs to be built around what you want to achieve from outsourcing your VAT compliance to a third party provider. For sure, 120%. Um, so the project, the project aspect is, is is one element. The second element that I'd, I'd focus on would be around the communications plan. A lot of the time, when you're engaged on projects, you only think of the project. You only think of that little ecosystem that you're in, trying to get things done. But there's a there's a hell of a lot of more people involved. You have key stakeholders at high levels, lower levels within the, within the organisation. And a very interesting fourth episode covering continuous transaction controls with Lisa Dowling. Uh, speaking about continuous compliance and now I'm speaking about continuous transaction controls but I just think it you know it drives home that it's such a topical kind of a discussion at the moment that everybody is having and everybody's looking to Europe to see what's going on in Europe and what's going to happen next from a, a continuous transaction control point of view and what that really means so let me just dive into the agenda and um, because I'm conscious of time as well and um, I'm going to cover CTCs the meaning and the overview I'm going to look at country specific approaches, just current approaches and what's coming in the future. Um, what's next? So this really will be my opinion. I, I know that Kid gave a great uh, kind of strategic opinion of what was coming down the line. And I'll give my opinion based on the experiences that we have in, in Taxback International. And then just some general considerations then for businesses. So let's just dive right into the, the meaning and the overview when we talk about CTCs, because it really is a new new-ish terminology. We have, uh, you know, continuous transaction controls. We have digital reporting requirements, D or or. So these are kind of new um, terminology that's, you know, explaining the same thing. It's still explaining e-invoicing. It's still explaining e-reporting and that kind of general move towards these kind of new reporting levels uh, throughout Europe. So I'm going to look at number one, mandatory real-time invoice reporting and validation by the tax authorities through e-invoicing and then e-reporting of transactional data uh, to the tax authorities. So both these forms of CTCs allow tax authorities to collect data on business transactions directly from the business management systems, as we all know, in real time, near real time, periodically or on demand. So we have seen that rollout in Italy of mandatory B2B e-invoicing. We have seen SII uh, in Spain, which is real time reporting of transactional data, sales and purchase transactions. Uh, we have seen Hungary RTIR, which is the immediate reporting of sales invoice data. And why are we seeing these kind of rollouts? So the CTCs are just another tool in the fight against fraud and the reduction in the VAT gaps. So that's it for series two. Uh, thanks so much everyone for watching and for the great engagement throughout the series. Uh, please do keep an eye out for series three, which will be coming your way in the autumn.